breaking it all down, I'm count zero. Now, previously we've had the Hugo Awards. At the time this goes out, the Hugo Awards will have been basically two weeks prior. And the book that won Best Novel was Connie Willis's Blackout and All Clear, which I previously reviewed and I stated in short that I didn't like. And but there are plenty of other titles that are nominated that are very good, aside from just the earlier reviewed The Dervish House. This week, I'm going to take a look at another one of these books that was, that was nominated, but unfortunately didn't quite win it. And that book is The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms by N.K. Jemsen. And which not only was the and which was not only nominated for the Hugo Award for Best Novel, but is also the author's first novel. Before I get into this review, though, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between fantasy and science fiction. Now, the fantasy genre as a whole is one of them, as a whole, is one of those things that is just kind of tricky to nail down. Do you use a really bad analogy? It's a bit like obscenity. You know it when you see it. As my general rule of thumb, here's how I describe fantasy. Fantasy stories are ones which are set in either another world or a world that is basically past Earth or previous Earth. In this fantasy setting, there it needs to have some sort of medieval technological level, medieval or further back. So that it's basically, in other words, you're dealing with people using swords, axes, edge weapons, that sort of thing. And technology as we know it does not necessarily exist. It may exist through the form of some of magic or something like that. And that's the other important thing to separate fantasy from science fiction or other similar works. They need to have the presence of magic. Some force which doesn't follow the laws of physics as we know it. Something where if it were it ha does have to operate on rules, but the rules are so different from anything we know as far as physics and the basically all the natural laws that it's basically its own force of its own, its own rules of its own. Now, what these rules are for magic depends on the type of story, and basically these rules vary depending on the dramatic requirements of the settings. I want to give you a few examples on this, um, as far as what types of narrative setting require what types of rules for magic. For example, in swords and sorcery stories, there's magic, but magic is generally incredibly involved, and aside from using it to create shields or enchant swords or other weapons, it's used to summon and control demons and other sorts of otherworldly spirits, or to summon a plague of darkness or something similar like that. These rituals tend to be involved and dramatic, and usually if something goes wrong, then bad things happen. These rituals may also, if done by an evil, well, also tend to involve evil sorcerers and may involve a the sacrifice of some maiden who will need to be rescued by our sword welding hero. There will be exceptions made to this magic force, grinding pools and crystal balls, um, allowing the sorcerer to see far places and communicate with people at long distances. Again, this is dramatic. This allows the villain to get advance notice of our hero's plans and thus put something else in our hero's way. It also allows the villain to communicate with our heroes and mock them at a distance, um, providing a the dramatic image of the villain's face floating in midair, taunting our heroes. Um, heroic fantasy stories are more close to your Lord, standard Lord of the Rings fare, so if you've, if you've seen or read Lord of the Lord of the Rings, if you've watched Record of Lotus War, if you've read Terry Brooks, you'll know exactly what you're getting into with heroic fantasy. To a certain degree, when it comes to fantasy, this is what we think about. Mythic fantasy stories are ones where the gods are much more involved in human affairs. Because of the cosmic powers involved, the plots of these books tend to focus more on the schemes and plans of gods and men, instead of the actions of your Conan story or your Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Not always. Um, you could argue that Clash of the Titans is more of a mythic fantasy story because 
of the heavy involvement of the gods in the storyline, but that's a bit of another matter. Finally, we get to the exception to the rules, as, I mean, frankly, when it comes to having rules, half the fun is breaking them and playing with the rules. For example, oftentimes a swords and sorcery storyline can be done in a post-apocalyptic setting, where magic has returned, and the and this has changed the balance of power, or perhaps even that magic has completely eclipsed the use of science, um, or even that mat that science has been lost as a common knowledge, and thus the magic in the setting is more along the lines of sufficiently advanced technology. Some classic examples of this from literature and popular culture is Jack Vance's Dying Earth series, Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun series, and yes, even Thundar the Barbarian. Alternatively, the setting could turn out to be some sort of spacecraft or space station or slow colony, slow boat style colony ship, like with the early Might and Magic games, as well as the anime series Scrapped Princess. So, this brings me to this week's book. While this book was nominated for a Hugo Award for Best Novel, I would really define this book as being more of a mythic fantasy book novel. Magic is powerful, plentiful, and, with, and ranges in its use from the very mundane to the gem, absurdly dramatic levels of, of what it can do, the flashy and destructive. And also in the setting, the, also in the story, the gods of the setting are integral to the book's plot. Now, as I mentioned, as you probably noticed earlier when I held up the book, I went with the audiobook on this one. Often with fantasy settings, there are some weird pronunciations and stuff, and it's totally different from the different pronunciations and special pronunciations of names from the Dervish House, oftentimes we're dealing with languages which simply don't exist in the real world. So I want the audiobook in this because I wanted to try and get the names somewhat correct. So, the book follows Yenidar, whose, mo whose mother was part of the Royal Aramari family, before she basically went and married a commoner and left the household. Now, shortly, soon before the book had begun, um, Yene's mother had died under suspicious circumstances, and then Yene received a summons to the capital city of Skye, where she is told that she is one of three heirs to the throne. The other two heirs are her cousins. And Yene basically has to subscribe, has to survive and get through all the various court intrigues to ba to get the throne, or even just survive the process. And as part of this, there's as a wild card in this whole thing is the matter of the Inafada. The Inafada are, in short, gods bound into human form. And both earlier in the setting, there was a long drawn-out war between two factions of the gods, which caused horrifically destructive damage to the entire world. And basically, the Inafada are the gods who lost. And as punishment for their misdeeds, they are bound in human flesh. And while they still possess colossal power, there are restrictions on what they can and cannot do. And Thus, this leads to interesting situations, because they're subservient to humans, yet they are bound, yet they are very, very powerful, and can't be trifled with lightly. In many ways, they're kind of similar to the Fey Folk, except even more powerful. It's like Greek gods combined with the Fey Folk. Now, there's a lot more to this than that, but this is a very, very, not going to say convoluted, but it's a book chock full of intrigue both of the human court and of the affairs of deities and I mean I really don't want to spoil any of this there's a lot in there now but again in there this is a mythic fantasy novel it's to be expected with to have this sort of in to sort of colossal intrigue and schemes within schemes I mean if you look at even something as simple a classic work of mythology like the Iliad, the majority of the book's plot is taken up with the schemes of the gods against each other, of 
gods who have allied with one group of mortals and gods who have allied with another group of mortals and whether or not to become personally involved in the goings on because of the destructive side effects that could happen if they do get involved and all this other sorts of stuff. And now this convoluted, this double convoluted plot can cause problems. It can get this lead to deus ex machina as it can lead to the writer just pulling stuff out of various portions and orifices of their anatomy because they need something to get to do just because they need to have something happen and not thinking things through but fortunately everything here makes sense everything here meshes everyone's motivations fit it's not quite like dune where we have a 30 xanatos pile up to a degree that every time you reread the book or re-listen to the audiobook, you pick up something you didn't notice the first time. But that's fine. I mean, for the first go of a writer, for their first published novel, this is still really good. I mean, to have this level of intrigue and machinations among the characters and have everything make sense is extraordinarily impressive. I mean, I'm not expecting you to, for all writers of this type of work, to bust out the giant Gordian knot of conspiracy, but if you're going to do it, getting it right is hard. And so if you do get it right, more power to you. Now, I do have one complaint about this book, and that's related to sense of place. This is something which I've brought up a lot with fantasy, other works in general, is having a sense of where we are, not the geography of the location, but what this place I'm at in the book looks like. Is it goth does it look like a gothic cathedral? Does it look like a space station? That that sort of thing. For the City of Sky, we did a fairly decent job of this, of setting up the idea of what the of what the town not even town, what the this gigantic sprawling city looks like and feels like. However, I guess my main complaint is we see a lot of sky. We don't see a lot of anywhere else. Um, in particular, I mean, Yen is homeland is uh, described as being basically northern barbarians. But what does that really mean? Is this, are, are they, is the north a very cold area? Is it like Scandinavia where everyone's wearing furs? And does it have like Nordic architecture? Is this perhaps more northern north compared to say, oh, Alexandria, Egypt, but still a temperate climate? Are we talking Greece? Are we talking France or Germany? Is or even for that matter, are is this north in comparison to South Africa? Is the society that Yen is culture comes from would it be? compared to the cities of North Africa with the city of Sky be and the city base built around it and the society there being comparable to Southern Africa, the Zulu. It's I mean it, there's your mag differences. I mean every planet has a north and everywhere is north in relation to someone else pretty much. More or less. When when you much you hit the poles, you hard to get further north than that, but my point still stands. It's we don't kind of get an explanation of this. It would have been nice to have been to get that just to put this place in perspective, put the setting in perspective. Um, but other than that, frankly, do I recommend this book? Absolutely. I wouldn't have given this my number one spot for the uh, Hugo Awards voting. Were I eligible to vote, I still would have given the Der Dervish House this spot. But this is a solid number two. This is, and for example, this is a solid book in general. I strongly recommend you pick this up. And I'm definitely looking forward to reading the rest of the books in this series, because if this is the first book by N.K. Jemsen, what's the sophomore effort going to be? What's the, what's coming next? And I'm sensing promising things here. This is definitely an author to check out and keep an eye out for in the future. So, till next time, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.